Chairman, Alex is a uh, practicing head and neck cancer surgeon and researcher. His uh, research is focused on the intersection of business, ethics, and data science in the operating room. Uh, and he is a, a graduate of Pritzker and the surgical uh, uh, head and neck, otolaryngology head and neck residency program here at the University of Chicago. He went off to Vanderbilt where he completed a fellowship and then we were fortunate enough to have him back here on the faculty for a number of years where he, he did some really innovative work and I had the good uh, fortune of working with him and calling him for help in the operating room on more occasions than he would like to admit. Uh, but uh, uh, Alex uh, just recently moved to Vanderbilt where he uh, is continuing his uh, uh, work in surgery as well as uh, research uh, in ethics. And I must say, uh, Alex is a good friend and also someone that I've known uh, when, since his early 20s, we were deciding, before he went to medical school, Alex and I worked together. So it's a real pleasure for me to uh, welcome Alex. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, thanks everyone. It's such a privilege to be here. This was a, it was a very hard three acts to follow. They were awesome presentations, so it's a privilege to uh, be a part of it. I think you're hearing a theme today that, uh, you know, when Mark asked me to give the talk, I gave this very generic title. And um, the gentleman in the back, I, I'm not sure I don't know you, but uh, thank you for generating some buzz about the talk. I did change the topic just two weeks ago based on some stuff recently in the news. Um, so. Uh, disclosures, I um, uh, am not doing uh, good a job as Stacy as far as my uh, thing, but I also started a company while I was here at the University of Chicago. I think we were very similar uh, uh, pathways there. And I won't be talking anything about any of the products there, but I will be sharing some data that was generated by that company because it supports some of the concepts here. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, I'm a data guy, as, as Peter mentioned, and uh, you know, I, I study the operating room. I look for ways to collect data out of the operating room, and so, um, you know, what you can see here is this idea of double booking surgery. So, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, great. So, um, you know, basically, if you have a surgeon and they're working in multiple rooms, that's called double booking, concurrent overlapping cases, the different terms larger. The thing was, this did not come out of my lab, but actually out of the Boston Globe which was pretty fascinating. This is real data that they obtained through sources that they will not reveal uh, about uh, what was actually happening on an actual surgical schedule. Now that name of the patient there was also published. This was a patient who had a bad outcome. And so uh, they were, uh, it was a complaint against this uh, surgeon who they're showing their picture and a little bit about him. It's, it's pretty dramatic. Um, and this was the, the title of the, the expose, The Clash in the Name of Care, which is, it's, just a, it's a good read, and I encourage people to read it. And you know, it's even including things like uh, Bobby Jenks, who was a, a pitcher, I believe, and uh, credited the end of his career to this surgeon here. And that's all in that article as well. So um, <clears throat> this blew up on social media, and uh, that, that's my favorite right there. That's pretty funny. So. And, and it, it, cr it created a lot of stir and, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, writing sort of immediately about it. So um, what is the sort of rules around concurrent surgery? Well, if you look at the billing rules, the CMS will say that it's that the critical or key portion. And you'll notice that it's very important here that it says that the teaching physician determines. And the whole idea behind this is, theoretically, there's somebody in the room doing something, a resident, a trainee of some kind, and that the, uh, the attending surgeon is bouncing between these rooms, but you know, they're ensuring that they're there for the critical portions of the procedure. Whether or not they're doing it, the, the point is that they're uh, participating in that. Um, and then the uh, American College of Surgeons uh, sort of, first of all, affirms that you know, the surgeon's personally responsible, that's, that's uh, an obvious, and that they can delegate parts of the procedure, that that's ethical, it's part of training, it's a long-standing tradition of, of making sure that you know, everything happens for the patient, but that you delegate appropriate parts to your trainees. Um, and that it's a, a proper to delegate, of course, again, with this key components of the operation. So an undefined term, I think importantly an undefined term at this point, um, but something that that is how we've defined it uh, is, is based on what the physician decides. So I put these goofy pictures up here just to start with a statement that says, I, I'm not really someone who subscribes to the captain of the ship, surgeon is the captain of the ship of the operating room, but much more it's like the A-team here. So everybody participates in the care of the patient and 
the, the reason that I think it's important to make that distinction is because I'm drawing a particular dyad in here between the patient and the surgeon. Because even though this is the A team, the only person that the patient has met before the operation is the surgeon. That's the person that they came to their clinic, that's their doctor in many circumstances, and that's also the person who's going to be taking care of that patient after the operating room event ends. Whereas the rest of the team tends to be pretty focused in the operating room, particularly talking about the anesthesiologists and the nurses who will be taking care of that patient. So uh, in this case, the surgeon, and I show this to just show delegation. So the surgeon is delegating the care of that patient, whether explicitly or just implicitly, as in if I work at the University of Chicago, I'm implicitly uh, you know, uh, delegating the care of the anesthesia to my anesthetic colleagues. And uh, similarly, uh, the, the setup of the room, the padding of the patient, the other things that the nurses take care of to ensure that patient's safety and uh, documentation. And then uh, delegating portions of the actual technical performance of that procedure to, uh, to uh, trainees. This article came out. It's an interesting timing on this article because uh, the, the events at Massachusetts General were starting to get, come to a bit, a bit of a fever pitch. This is before the expose was announced. And uh, the uh, editor in chief of the journal that this was published in is a, the chief of surgery, I think, at uh, Massachusetts General, or uh, an important surgeon at Massachusetts General. So there's, there's probably some reason why that happened to come out then, but uh, I don't know. But it was in defense of overlapping surgery. So um, they bring up a really good point. This idea that the American College of Surgeons stands by this as well, this idea that it's important to, to train trainees. And if the first time that they're ever alone is the first time that they're out in practice, that's probably a bad thing. And the reason that it's important is because if you think about it, let's say that you and I are operating together and you're performing this procedure and I'm watching you perform the procedure. If you're going along and I'm not saying anything, you know you're doing a good job, right? Because I'll, I'll start complaining or pointing out things if something's not right. Whereas if I'm not in the room, that same silence has a much different meaning. You, you're stuck with your own thoughts. You're thinking through the procedure. So it's really important for trainees to get that experience, to be able to think through, have the angst of wondering, should I make this, should I make that not? And you never want to put a trainee in that situation and not something where they're adequately prepared to handle that. But there's still a little bit of amount of stress, and they need to go through that. Um, they point out some key things, you know, attending surgeon, disclose and provide informed consent, uh, you know, do all the right things, supervise, and I think this is really key here, knowing their trainee's skill level, they'll come up again, and be immediately available. So this is what happens when you actually have a surgical case. This is everything that goes into a surgical case. I spent a lot of time studying OR workflow, and so you can see that here's the procedure down here. The patient actually enters the room there, and leaves the room there. And this is not necessarily to scale as far as the time. In fact, this probably takes up a much larger portion in many cases. But for short cases, that's not the case. And then throughout this case, there's different portions of the procedure that may be critical portions and maybe sort of non-critical portions. And we'll get into those definitions a little bit. But the point is, you already see there's tons of delegation that's going on. There's tons of saying, OK, you know, this needs to happen by this person, this needs to happen by this person. And the attending surgeon is not doing all of those things. So even though the other person that the patient's you know, contracting with, they're not handling all those things. And I would even argue some things I shouldn't be doing. I mean, I certainly know how to put in a Foley catheter. I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times. But the last time I did it was many years ago because you know other parts of the team are performing that function. So should I be the one that's naturally turned to do that? Should be the most experienced member of the team for that part? Maybe. <clears throat> all right, so there's some forces that are acting upon uh, hospitals and surgeons and healthcare in general. So one of them is the increasing employment by hospitals of surgeons. So moving away from the private practice model to an employed model. And so because of that, you know, surgeons want to maximize their time for profit. But you know, as they become employees of hospitals, they're going to want to, you know, the hospitals are going to want to maximize their time. Now, the, you know, as Taylor Swift says, the payer's going to pay, 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 pay. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, so they're going to pay the hospital, but you know, as uh, our uh, healthcare payment system shifts, we're going to see that um, it's not going to necessarily, and this is something that Stan Goldblatt and I were talking about earlier, it's it not necessarily going to be on an um, item by item, you know, uh, RVU based system. You may actually have, you know, accountable care organizations, bundle payments, other things where it's even going to be beneficial to the payers and the healthcare system as a whole to maximize the time of the highest paid part of healthcare, right? It's the professional fees. Those are the, the, the professional labor is the, high, the most expensive part of healthcare. And so it's beneficial to the whole system to maximize surgeon time. Okay, so 
if we look at this idea of an optimized surgical scheduling, you know, this is where you can see that you know, the surgeon's basically bouncing back and forth between the procedures. And this is that non-operative time that I showed you in that graph earlier. And so this would be great. So basically, the, patient's, the, the surgeon's got absolutely no downtime whatsoever. But there's quite a bit of downtime there you know, for the operating room, for the other members of the team. So then we can imagine a really optimized schedule there where just the critical portions of the procedures and they're jumping through the room. So basically there's absolutely no time time. This sounds really stressful to me as a surgeon, but you know, um, it actually, you know, it doesn't leave much room for teaching or for uh, uh, talking to families, counseling patients. Gretchen, what you said at the end of your talk was the greatest thing I've heard all day, which is the idea that not just a technician, but really you want to take care of people. So we don't just want to do the surgery, we want to actually, you know, help help our patients. So, so this seems stressful, but, but theoretically, this would be the most optimal use of the time. There's probably a balance somewhere in here. And I should say this is also a bit of a, uh, a manufacturer here because it's, uh, it's not uh, possible under medical rules. And then here lies the biggest problem with this idea. So you can create this perfect schedule, and then something can happen in this case, and it runs long, and suddenly you are overlapping like you didn't intend to. Now you apply that to the other, this one, and it's going to break down immediately. Um, so why does this unintended overlap happen? And um, this is data from uh, three surgeons here, A, B, and C, uh, who are performing all oh, the same procedure, <laughs> left, left, right, left, and uh, up on this axis is time, okay? And then these are each of the steps of that procedure, just numbered out. And so each bar here represents one of their iterations of that procedure. Procedure one, procedure two, procedure three for surgeon B. And I'll just draw your attention to step four, something happened in that case, it just ran longer. And that happens sometimes, and it happens for all sorts of reasons that we don't really understand. We don't have great data on what happens in the operating room, believe it or not. And so, you know, any of these things could happen. It might be mentioned in the operative report. It might not. And these are things including, you know, uh, uh, missing, you know, the attending's absent, of course, but also if the trainee's like, you know, good or not very good or, you know, the struggle, if it's something to do with the patient itself or if it's a system factor. So we need to understand these things to begin to think about how to intelligently schedule surgery to maximize surgeon's time, but still ensure that they're giving good care to the patients. So what it is is it's a balance here between patient waiting, which we never want, you know, uh, anesthetic time is unnecessary, or unattended surgery where like, you know, someone is doing it but no one's, you know, no one of a, a responsibility is paying attention. We would never want anything like that. And then, uh, but we don't also want the surgeon waiting, you know, and this is a wasted resource for healthcare. And also there's a work-life balance thing. I mean, you know, believe it or not, we're people too. And, uh, you know, uh, with the, to maintain, to prevent burnout and to maintain a good surgeon workforce, you want to also ensure that they're not doing things that are uh, uh, sort of non-value added time. <clears throat> so we need better data on surgical activity. And that's getting back to this critical portion of the procedure idea. The idea that, so, you know, patient's anatomy is going to feed into the definition of what the critical portion of the procedure for that patient's going to be. The case factors, which include things really specific to that case. And then the surgeon factors, which includes also the ability of the assistants and that surgeon's familiarity with their team. If you're working with your fellow that you've worked with for the past six months doing the same exact thing over and over and over, and they're good, and you know they're technically good, and you've given them a little leash, and you can see that they're doing a good job, that's the sort of you know, case where you know that the, the critical portion, the part where you absolutely need to be doing it, is going to get smaller and smaller as the fellow is able to take over more control of that. Um, so, you know, what people have asked for is, well, why doesn't the American College of Surgeons just define the critical portion of the procedure? And that would be hitting the central thing here. But one of the problems is it doesn't take into effect the, uh, the factors that might uh, modify the critical portion of the procedure for that case. Um, nevertheless, I took a stab at it, uh, some ideas of critical portions. Um, so the objective of the procedure, the uh, part of the procedure that might have substantial risk of adverse outcomes, uh, and a part that requires intraoperative decision making. Now, what I think is interesting about you know uh, Larry's presentation, this most recent one, is you know he, for his cases, some of them, the critical portion of the procedure may not have even occurred in the operating room. It's that it's that planning step, or it's it's a couple of ideas about well, we'll make an incision here, and an incision here, and an incision here. But some of the technical aspects of that really aren't that critical. Some of them are for his cases. It's very complicated cases, but some it's much more about the planning. And so it's hard to define critical portions for a given procedure. 
And then there's also this last part, which I think is important. And uh, this means two things to me. So it's, part of it is, if I tell you I'm personally going to be doing it, then I, I'm lying if I don't do it. So that is completely wrong. Um, and then additionally, it's what I feel like I need to personally do. And let's get back to that team factor. So this idea that if I'm operating with a bunch of novices that have never done the case before, then basically the whole case is a critical portion because I'm the only one in the room who can do it. Whereas if it's a case that's quite routine and I'm working with a team that has done it many times before, there might be very little of it that I personally need to do. Um, we had some uh, research just recently, Claire Smith, I don't know if she's in the audience, but uh, she did some research with me just recently uh, along with uh, Christy Guyton. Really neat stuff where she interviewed uh, surgeons about their feelings about doing surgery on awake patients, so patients who are conscious in the operating room. And you guys are probably already reading the slide, and so I don't need to go through it other than to say there's a couple of key things out of this quote. So, um, because when the patient really sees that someone else is doing it, so the resident's operating on the patient, the surgeon is, is sort of helping direct them, there's sometimes a little bit of upsetting to people. So it's this idea of surgeons not wanting to have their patients be anxious or uncomfortable, despite perhaps something going on that they feel is okay. You know, they trust their resident, they know that they're doing a good job, they're watching you do a good job in this scenario, but they're worried that the patient may get so anxious about that that it may cause harm that was unintended. And then this one is sort of a shocking thing. Um, and I believe that this surgeon is probably, again, a good person acting off uh, uh, that same principle of trying to alleviate anxiety despite the fact that um, you know, there's a bit of subterfuge in there. And so what this creates is there's this tension between you know, ensuring patient comfort, alleviating anxiety, ensuring good outcomes, but also giving residents appropriate clinical training. And an important finding out of this study as well, which I'm not showing you, is that many surgeons reported they just didn't do teaching during awake procedures that they just did it themselves uh, for these reasons, and, and uh, it was, they, they reserve teaching for when the patient's fully asleep. Well, that makes you wonder, you know, I mean, do you feel good about teaching, or do you not feel good, and should we uh, explore that a little more? Okay, so uh, I don't know if this is gonna play, if I, no, it's not. Can you play it, or can I play it? I can, I got it, uh, okay. So uh, very briefly, uh, there are two surgeons here, one's holding the blue thing, one's holding the knife, Oh, and I'm just gonna, there he goes. There you go. Okay. Who's doing the procedure? They're both doing it, right? They're both doing it. But the, one of them's the attending surgeon, one of them's the resident. The point is, it's really hard to define who, quote, does the procedure. Now, we can generate some really interesting data about who's creating more of the technical moves or something. But the point is, really, you're operating with your brain. You know, the attending surgeon is there, they're helping the resident, it's a technical procedure, it's a team procedure, and so really narrowing down, like, are you doing it or is your resident doing it? You know, unless you're not in the room at all and the, the resident is operating completely independently, in reality, anytime you're around, the, you are doing it as an attending uh, surgeon. And so that again gets back to this idea, and this is something that Peter and I were just talking about, and I think it was a really good point that he made, which was, it's, you know, the surgeon's duty to ensure that the procedure goes well, that everything goes off correctly for that patient, utilizing all of the resources that are available to that surgeon. So, you know, if that includes the trainees, that includes the delegates, includes everybody that's around that. And so the surgeon's ultimately responsible for the good outcome, but doesn't necessarily have to physically do every single part of the procedure. Okay, so um, this was along these same lines, and, and I think it's important, so this was a neat New England Journal article, and this is talking about the silence of the switch. And you can see the beginning here. We stand and swap the operating room chairs, soundless in our socked feet. And this is a resident reporting that, that she did not feel comfortable when her attending would um, have them take off their shoes and then the attending had, you know, was standing over the patient as if they were gonna be doing the procedure during awake surgery. And then uh, the attending gets up silently and lets the resident sit down and actually do it, but pretends like, you know, pretends like the, she's doing it. And so the, um, the two things here that they bring up as far as their critical steps, so one is the surgeon-patient relationship. This idea that if the trainee's gonna be doing it, they have to have some skin in the sort of uh, uh, ethical game here and actually help consent the patients, help the patient understand that the trainee's gonna be doing things in the procedure. 
And then there's also the subjective data. And so it's not just like what they're physically going to be doing, but perhaps what the specific complication rates or risks, additional risks that the patient may be taking on as a result of having that trainee participate in your surgery. So I think that transparency and truthfulness in training are absolutely ethically correct. I think they're clearly societally demanded. And you know, uh, one example of this is the surgeon scorecard. So if you're familiar with ProPublica, this caused a lot of stir about, I don't know, four months ago or something. Um, but the idea was ProPublica released all this outcomes data about surgeons. So you can see here, uh, you can look up a hospital. I looked up a random hospital and, you know, names a hospital by name. And it says, you know, for each of these surgeons who's performing that procedure in that hospital, you know, these are their complication rates. And, you know, so th this is a high complication, you know, at least one surgeon has a terrible complication rate. And that's, that's real data transparency that's, that's happening out there. Now, this caused a big stir because actually their methodology was not great. And if you sort of go back and calculate some of the numbers, which other people have done, they've shown that the, the, the likelihood of being, you know, in this group versus this group can be pretty close depending on how high of a volume you have. And so it's sort of unfairly marking some people perhaps as high complication or vice versa as low complication. And this becomes this risk of, you know, if you're as a patient and you rely on some data that's not that great and you make a decision about, you know, going to a doctor for those reasons, there's a risk that you're going to be misled in ways that you don't intend. And so if it's uh, not 100% accurate information, it's going to be a problem. So we need more and better information. We need people to be doing it more. And I would say the same thing for the Boston Globe article, although I think it's brave and great that they're doing this. You know, they didn't show all the other times that this guy had his operative schedule. Maybe this is the same thing that that surgeon does every single time, and this is the only complication they've ever had. Maybe we can't blame it on the overlapping surgery. It sure looks suspicious when seen in isolation. There's also maybe not enough data here. So again, we're looking at so the non-operative times versus the operative times. And so what if this were the schedule that he saw? We said, well, gosh, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. You know, the, the patient was being positioned and prepped, and they were getting an art line, which took an extra hour, and there were all these other things. And finally, when your operation was ready to start, that surgeon was ready to hop over and do the procedure. So they never left Bobby Jenks' room. You know, or conversely, that they were completely overlapping, or even better yet, seeing the critical portions of the procedure and how they were overlapping or not. And so I think you could have even more transparent data and then really get to the answer of, do you have a physician who's maybe doing the wrong thing? Or do you have a physician who's actually really trying to do a good thing and just trying to maximize the amount of time that they can give to caring patients? So I think it's ethically correct. I think it's societally demanded. And I think it's technically possible. And this gets back to the stuff I talked about last year and I continue to work on my lab, is with continuous data recording in the operating room, we can actually get at the answers to some of these questions. And uh, um, we can balance the um, surgeon time, training experience, and most important, patient safety. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Anton.